Hi, everyone, and welcome to uh, another installment of ARK Invest's Big Ideas within this Academic Insight Series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about orbital aerospace with Samson Williams. Samson, can you can you introduce yourself and let everyone know, know what you do? Hey, good morning, beautiful people. My name is Samson Williams. Uh, today, since we're talking about the space economy, I'm going to introduce myself as partner at Milky Way Economy, a D.C., Florida-based think tank who answers the questions you can't Google. All right, excellent. I like that. Nice, short, and sweet. So, so now that we're talking about, you know, so with, with, with the ARK Invest report that came out, um, ARK Invest talked about in terms of in terms of space travel, you know, they said that there's going to be a significant reduction in costs uh, in terms of satellite launches and rocket landings. Uh, due to due to you know the technological advancements, right? In terms of in terms of deep learning, uh, mobile connectivity, sensors, three D printing, and robotics, um, we had at the at the time of the writing of that of that article didn't really have the developments <laughs> like Chat GPT and GPT four and things like that, and you know with uh, with uh, with uh, Stanford University coming out with Lama, Lama and Alpaca, you know, last couple of weeks, you know, I'm just serious. I'm just curious on your thoughts of, you know, how how this how these developments you think will be, you know, impacting this this area. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Dr. Um, Joel Mosier, he is the chief scientist for Space Force. He was recently at Concordia University in Wisconsin, and he was giving a, a lecture about sci-fi and the importance of sci-fi, Wakanda Forever. I know it's a podcast, but I just gave everybody Wakanda Forever. Um, and part of that is we live in the future, and in the future, the cost to get upstream for rockets, that's going to be about $200 a kilo. So to put it in comparisons right now, if you're getting on a depending on whose launch service you're using, you're paying anywhere between 15 and 20K per kilo, which is actually actually quite uh, an improvement over historical when we had the space shuttle versus our, our current rockets that we use. But in the future, when I say in the future, we're talking mid 2030s, uh, $200 a kilo. That means that pretty much anyone who wants, or rather there is a segment of the society who will wanna be space tourists, who will be able to afford a, uh, at peak efficiency, seven hundred fifty thousand to a million dollar ticket. It sounds like a lot, but there's a significant number of folks on Earth who's like, "Hey, bet I want to do this." And so, why that's important, not just for space tourism, is that launch providers—they're the Ubers and Lyfts of the space economy. So there is a market where we have a number of launch providers who serve as the Uber and Lyft drivers of the space economy to get us up into orbit so that we can visit the Axiom Space, Sierra Space, Orbital Assembly, Cislunar Industry built space stations. So why that's so important is without space stations, no one wants to be stuck in a something the size of a Volkswagen bug basically for three or five days. Uh, you need space stations, whether you're a Deep Space Nine or a behemoth type person, you need space stations, not only for tourism, but so that academics, like yourself, particularly biomedical researchers, can go into space <clears throat> and unlock the secret of immortality and microgravity, as well as explore how different chemicals, compounds, uh, building blocks of, of DNA, RNA, et cetera, they behave differently in microgravity. And so you need space stations for that to work so that you could have scientists who are on station uh, year round. And I'm gonna pause by saying, we're in the year 2023. The space, the International Space Station has been aloft for about 22 years now, meaning for the last two decades, we've had a human off planet no, with, with, no, with no injuries, no severe injuries. So it's possible. And so when we talk about space stations, we are talking about not only the International Space Station, but also uh, the Chinese Space Station, whose name I forget at this moment. I apologize. The copy hasn't kicked in. But right now we have two space stations orbiting Earth, which sets the foundation for the real space economy. Because most people think that, hey, we're all about rockets. For the last 80 years, we've done up and out investments, meaning we're trying to get on our rockets and go up and out. But now we're looking at uh, in orbit, satellites, manufacturing, 3D printing, 
and bringing those services as well as good and products down into the gravity well that is earth. And we call that at Milky Way, we call that down and around investments. Very interesting. So yeah, so I'd rather, I know about, so whenever you say economies, you know, I wrote down a number of different things, you know, what's your, what's your thoughts on, so the first thing I wrote down was space insurance. So if those people are going out in space, right, what's this, what's this space insurance industry going to look like, <laughs> in your opinion? <laughs> uh -huh. <clears throat> Uh, this is space insurance is going to be fantastic. I mean, I think once upon a time that before before the pandemic that lived in Dubai and there was already this is 2018 a reinsurer for space insurers, uh, particularly for rocket and launch. And so as you're thinking about uh, this year, um, SpaceX is supposed to put up around 3000 satellites. So the uh, the FAA. Um, Federal Aviation Administration, you have to follow a flight plan with them to tell you what you're going to put up in the space. That's how we know, oh, SpaceX by themselves, they're going to claim around 3,000 parking spots. So if you put up a satellite in space, consider that a parking spot at the mall. You want all the good parking spots. Why that's important is A, it's a land grab by SpaceX. We'll talk about that national security implications later. Um, but oh, I got so distracted by my angst with him for uh, the national security issues with uh, him claiming all these good parking spots. I forgot what I was going to tell you. What was my point? Ah, I forgot, Justin, you have to, you have to remind me. All right. Well, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll get to it once we're going through, once we're going through the, through all this, but so in terms of, in terms of the two space, the, the space stations that are currently there, you know, how, so like whenever you say space stations, I'm thinking like space hotels. So like how would that how would how would we be able to kind of scale out that particular that particular model? Because they're going to take up parking spaces as well, correct? Yeah, they're going to take up those premium orbits. And so it's the Tiangong. Uh, the final phase of the Tiangong went up uh, last year. And so and that's the Chinese space station because the Chinese were never uh, invited to the International Space Station. And so between the ISS and the Tiangong, the Chinese space stations, they are in those premium orbits because you got to remember um, things are technically falling to Earth uh, while they're in orbit and they have to get readjusted, readjusted so that they stay aloft. Um, and so why it's so important, the cost of rockets are going down, uh, SpaceX and others are able to put up more satellites. They're, they're claiming those premium parking spots. We will have more space stations. So again, Sierra Space, Orbital Assembly, Axiom, uh, Cislunar Industries will build space stations in space. Uh, so it is a, it's a gold rush, but the gold rush is actually space, meaning what physical orbit are they occupying? Because once those premium parking spots are gone, are rather occupied, they're going to stay there forever. And that's where you're going to have a couple of brand new space stations, probably owned by Merck. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, Dow Pharmaceuticals, whose sole purpose is how do we research, do bio research in orbit? Because again, your cells, they behave a little bit different. So here in, on Earth, your cells are under gravity. So think about it as a sponge, where if you push down on that sponge, uh, your cells are compressed. But in microgravity, that sponge lifts up. And when you lift up your sponge as, your, as well as your cells, they fundamentally behave differently. And so we already, through the uh, NASA's uh, Methuselah Challenge, um, rather through NASA's Millennial Challenge and the Methuselah Project, they've already done really great research on deep tissue uh, research for various organs. And they already grow better. They can demonstrate that they grow better in microgravity. So the real moment of why Samson talking about medical research in space is Justin needs a new uh, kidney, liver, heart, pancreas, uh, aortic valve. Using CRISPR and gene therapy, we're able to send your beam or fax your genetic code up. They grow you a new insert name of organ and send it back down the well. And so this is where most people, they're like, Samson, why are you talking about the space economy? Like I'm part of it. There have been more people in this in space than there have been on the internet. And you're like, what? 
I'm like, yes, there's been more people in space than you have been on the internet. I see your face and I'll explain it to you. Justin, you and I have never actually been on the internet, even though right now we're on the internet. However, uh, when we talk about humans into space, we have about 200 people who've actually been into space, like physically been there. But the rest of us, whether it's a GPS on our phone, a wristwatch, um, or this Zoom call right now, this podcast, that's facilitated by the space economy, which is why Elon Musk is in a rush to develop launch so he can claim all the good parking spots with his satellites because we're all part of the space economy because the space economy is the fifth industrial revolution. And in the fifth industrial revolution, it's all digital. And so space is a digital native place because in space, you don't take up paper, it weighs too much. And so if you're a big digital fan like myself, if you have all these satellites and they're already distributed, then that's awesome because that's a perfect application for blockchain. That's why we write a book called Blockchain in the Space Economy, because if you've already got a bunch of satellites distributed around the earth, rename them nodes and then tell us what kind of data thing you want to do on them. Um, and this is the why I'm so very excited about space in general. So first off, launch is important, but these are the Uber drivers. They make very little money. The satellite providers, the only reason launch exists, the only reason SpaceX exists for rockets was to deploy satellites, Starlink. They get most of their money off of Starlink. Why Starlink? They want to control the downstream. Upstream, little money. Instream satellites, eh, not so much money. Downstream, the data, because right now the data is limited to your cell phone calls, the Zoom, et cetera, your financial transactions when you're swiping your credit cards. In the future, the data will be Justin needs a new kidney. Justin needs a new organ. Let's beam his genetic code up, 3D print, and grow that organ upstream and then bring it downstream. And this is how you bring everyone into the space economy so that they can see like, oh yeah, we are part of the space economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, that's that's kind of, that's, that's a little, that's a little, little mind blowing right there. So, so I know that, I know that, you know, you said that there was, there were some, there were some concerns in terms of in terms of national security and what and what Elon was doing. Can you expand on that? A uh, little so, bit? so yeah, um, President Zelensky of Ukraine. He was on Twitter. You guys can't see my thumbs, but I'm making the Twitter the international symbol for Twitter. And he was like, "Hey, uh, Russia through their electronic warfare has turned off our internet here in Ukraine." And so Elon Musk got on Twitter and was like, "Bet I got you. I'll Starlink you up." And just like that, he said national policy. Um, because imagine if, for whatever reason, uh, China and China invaded Taiwan, turned off their internet through their electronic warfare, and then Elon Musk was like, "Oh, I got you. I'll deploy Starlink there." What would what would be China's response? China might not respond militarily, but they might respond financially. They're our biggest debtor. If some random oligarch in America is messing with your territorial uh, governmental policies, one of the things you could do is A, turn off his, or shut down his Tesla factories, B, uh, stop the shipment of microchips from Taiwan, which you've already done due to the invasion, and C, call up some of our debt. Uh, and so this is why while Elon Musk is a little cavalier on Twitter with his thumbs, because he's establishing space doctrine without consulting with anyone. He's doesn't, he wasn't voted, uh, no one picked him. Uh, he is a taxpayer funded enterprise. We all like to think that, you know, Elon Musk is the richest person on the planet. If you withdrew the funding he got from taxpayers through his SBIR um, grant back in uh, 2008, uh, he got uh, $156 million um, for a phase two, uh, SBR grant, he's actually just the modern day version of a welfare king. And so if we have the modern day version of a welfare king, Elon Musk setting our national security policy and the fifth industrial revolution, that digital ecosystem that is space, uh, that's a problem because those parking lots, the, those parking lots and those parking spots that he's, that SpaceX and others are currently sitting in, uh, as a form satellite arrays or satellite const const constellations, they're going to govern how warfare is fought in the 21st century and beyond. And I'll pause by saying 
when we say uh, Japan is uh, boost its military spending for 2023 and 2024 due to North Korean threats. And so as they go to look to modernize their army, Japan is not buying tanks. In the 21st century, pew, 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 you don't shoot at it. Only poor countries shoot at each other uh, with soldiers. In the 21st century, you deploy drones. You've got some kid sitting in uh, 2,000 miles away or on the other side of the earth, talking to a satellite, controlling a drone, calling in missiles are having the drone itself uh, impact and destroy the target. So modern day warfare, it's not grunts and trenches. That's what poor countries do. Uh, the modern day warfare is how do you cripple someone's uh, electronic and uh, infrastructure, number one, meaning you're, if you could turn off everybody's lights, turn off the power grid, turn off the water, et cetera. And two, if you are engaged in conflict, What's your drone to uh, soldier ratio? Because a drone, it costs you anywhere from, as we see in Ukraine, it costs you anywhere from uh, the low end, 500 bucks plus the munition, let's just call it $1,000 to the high end of 150,000. But they're highly effective. And so when you have a drone army and operators who are 10,000 miles from the battlefield, uh, one, it's super easy to replace a drone. They cost you, let's say it costs you $10,000 to replace a drone. Whereas to replace a human, you have to feed them until they're 18, train them until they're 22 years old, and then hope they don't get shot. It's, we're fundamentally on the verge of, tr of changing how warfare is fought. And because Elon Musk owns SpaceX and they're dominating those parking spots in space, as well as the satellites, he gets to set national space policy, space doctrine, but he's not an elected official. That's super dangerous. That's very, that's very interesting. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Elon, I'm a Elon, I'm a Elon freak. So yeah, that was that's that was very that was very interesting. Still love Elon, but <laughs> <laughs> so this has been this has been very interesting. I think I think we're gonna have to do a part two because we're out of time. Um, so so thank you for your time, uh, Samson Canary. Can you let everyone know where they can find you? Sure. Uh, you can find me on the Twitters at Hustle Fun Baby, um, our social media in general at Hustle Fun Baby. I'm a Hustle Fun Baby, not a Trust Fun Baby. So I do have a 21 year, 21 day old baby now, and he's going to be a Trust Fund Baby. It's ridiculous. Um, or you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Samson Williams, um, SamsonWilliams.com is another great place uh, to find me. Um, I do want to just say that. As we get more assets in the space, rockets become Uber drivers. So remember that the real value will be, how is this uh, GIS, geographic information systems, how is the data coming downstream monetized? Uh, and if you happen to be black, a person of color, and you're like, oh, I'm never gonna be an astronaut, that's awesome. The first quadrillionaire of the space economy, they won't make their money in uh, orbit they'll make it by monetizing the data that comes down onto the ground. Mm, that's huge. That's huge. So, so thank you. Thank you once again uh, for your time and for everyone else until next time. <laughs>